What are ways early and emerging civilizations constructed their identity? Pretty general question, but what we're going to do is talk about how epic traditions were used. And we'll talk about what those epic traditions were and how did epic traditions help create a sense of identity. All right, epic tales and identity. We're talking mainly Bronze Age, but not totally. When we talk about identity in the ancient world, like most of the literature that we have from the ancient world, we're talking about aristocrats. So make no mistake, we're not always talking about the identity of poor farmers, but people who can read, people who identify with their own country and countrymen. So this leaves a lot of people out. But the epic traditions are very important. They influence uh, literature and media today, whether it's high art or low art. So we're going to talk about the Epic of Gilgamesh, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, and Virgil's Aeneid. So when we look at the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, we go to the map, visualize where Sumeria is, right? Right at the south between the two rivers, Euphrates and Tigris. And that's where we get our earliest epic. This is a fiction tale. And an epic is exactly that, an epic fiction tale. And we're really, you'll get to know what an epic really is, an epic tradition is, uh, as we go. But just keep in mind, it's usually a, um, a pivotal work, a, a work that is probably one of the strongest works in a nation's canon, meaning these are the, often the most important works of a particular people's. Not, maybe not the oldest, uh, but the most highly recognized. So the Epic of Gilgamesh comes out of Sumeria, preserved by the Babylonians, and many of the versions we have were actually found in the destroyed site of Nineveh in Assyria. So it's a very old story, but wasn't written down until much later. The same is true for Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Both of these were constructed much earlier than they were written down, so we know they're not 100% authentic from their creation, but that's okay. They both come from a mysterious past. The epics talk about a heroic or mysterious past, heroic figures even, that founded your country or nation or, or culture. So these epics really kind of tie together. They have a certain strong cultural resonance. Um, so the Epic of Gilgamesh is your Mes Mesopotamian tale. And how do these help create a sense of identity? So let's look just at the epic, epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was a demigod. He was extremely tall, taller than most men by quite a large degree. And he was the leader of Uruk. Not Ur, but Uruk. One of the early Sumerian cities that we talk about. It's a very, very early king. And in the text of Gilgamesh, it talks about how there's a council of elders. And they call a lot of the shots, but they really have trouble uh, restraining Gilgamesh. He's a giant highly athletic, highly skilled, no one can match him in one-on-one -on -one combat. The city's really torn. It, it respects Gilgamesh. It, it's prosperity and protection they owe to Gilgamesh. He's so powerful and he respects them because they're his city, they're his people. You know, They know he's responsible for protecting them from their enemies and allowing them to prosper and enforcing laws and that sort of thing. The problem is, he keeps picking fights with all the young, young guys, you know, in their early 20s who were, you know, really into wrestling and boxing and, and warfare and that sort of thing. So Gilgamesh doesn't take a challenge lightly. So he, he just really kills too many of the sons of the city, his own people. He, occasionally he gets in a scuffle with one of them. Might just be a, a, fr a friendly kerfuffle, uh, but he ends up killing the lad or the man. Another problem Gilgamesh has with the city, remember they respect him and they owe their prosperity to him and their protection. Uh, but he's kind of killing their sons <laughs> and he's also impregnating their daughters and wives. He really can't stay away from the ladies. So there are no virgins, basically, even the wives of great nobles uh, he takes to bed. And they can't do anything about it. There's nothing they can do about it. So they protest to the gods and the gods see this and one of the gods, we'll talk more about the actual gods in, uh, on another week, but one of the gods, a female god, the creator of sort of the material world as we know it, she takes a piece of clay out of some water and uh, shapes it and creates another sort of giant demigod like Gilgamesh and named uh, Enkidu. And Enkidu is highly athletic, but he's kind of a wild man. He's never lived in a city. 
totally uncivilized. So Enkidu is a symbol of something Sumerians were, would have been very familiar with. They would have looked into their own history and into people who kind of live on the perimeter of Sumeria, who kind of live in the reeds, where you construct your home out of reeds and you just kind of live off the watery areas, but you're not a big into farming. They see in their own past that Enkidu was the wild man that their people once were, but Gilgamesh is that more civilized, kingly sort. And Enkidu, um, highly muscular, he had super long hair that looked like corn silk. So he had super long, I, I assume blonde hair, which would have looked <laughs> really weird in Mesopotamia. Uh, some blonde haired dude walking around. And he had thick hair, like the hair of a bull, how it's kind of flattened to the cow and kind of curly, you know? So he would have had just coarse hair all over his body, right? And so they create Enkidu to, to calm Gilgamesh down, to, to show Gilgamesh that there's another sort of natural force that can rival him. He needs to start focusing on more benevolent things than how great he is. And so there's a famous contest between Gilgamesh and Enkidu. I'll let you read about their relationship uh, in your reading. A lot of your reading has to do with the Epic of Gilgamesh. But they actually form a friendship and they go on different adventures. Gilgamesh would go through 12 labors, just like Hercules, more appropriately pronounced Heracles, that's the Greek word. Hercules is a Roman bastardization. And so we actually see the Epic of, Epic of Gilgamesh has the 12 labors of Gilgamesh, same as the 12 labors of Hercules or Heracles. We get quite a bit of later literature that borrows and adapts pieces from the Epic of Gilgamesh. We actually get our early flood myth from the Epic of Gilgamesh. There's a mention of the great flood prior to the Old Testament. Not the only place with a flood myth, of course. Has an example of mass deforestation for use with lumber and trade. And Gilgamesh does stuff like fight monsters. There are many symbols in it you can really look into and see that it's a commentary on sort of civilized life versus the wildness of nature. And so by the end, Gilgamesh is actually questing for immortality. And by the end, Gilgamesh realizes, and it's a moral lesson for everyone, sort of almost an early religious moral tale, is that no mortal can find immortality, even the greatest Gilgamesh. So I think that's a really neat early commentary on maybe a religious view even, is that after we die, there's really nothing else, you know? Not necessarily that there's nothing else, but that there's no hope of continuing, you know, in that state. They don't talk about his soul moving on like they do, say, in Egypt or what have you. It's more like the he early Hebrews. You know, there's no heaven, there's no hell, you just kind of die, but there are certain spiritual forces taking place. Um, so that's the Epic of Gilgamesh. I hope you enjoy reading about Gilgamesh in your reading. The Epic of Gilgamesh, I mentioned it, other sources and authors drew from it to create stories, like we talked about with Heracles and the Twelve Labors. The aristocracy also appropriated this epic. And so if you're kind of an upstart king, say you're in a, the kingdom of Kish, and you've just started an empire and you've taken over some of your neighbors, well, you kind of need to show your legitimacy. You're not just powerful at war, you have to be somewhat special. You have to be you know, an aristocrat. You have to prove that you're noble. Um, that's just common in ancient history and medieval history. And so what this king would do, and there really was a king who did this, and, and uh, most likely several, is they drew up basically a family tree to show how he was related to Gilgamesh. We don't, it was so long ago, uh, there's no way he could have proven that, that uh, he was related to Gilgamesh, right? But you actually see this with the epic traditions, all three of these because these works are so well known and so well read in their own society and so well respected and so well integrated that if you actually look at your own, say, national epic and you want to be a member of the nobility or a king, you're going to find a way to show how you're related to one of those people. Right? So we get that with the Iliad and Odyssey in Greece. We get that with the Aeneid in Rome. Of course, the Aeneid was kind of designed to function as an epic. It was more like... Um, they knew what they were doing ahead of time. Whereas these two epics here, they're just oral traditions that were passed on that were eventually exploited by aristocracy to uh, grant validity to their family line. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh, definitely early Bronze Age, okay? 
Homer's Iliad and Odyssey takes place in the late Bronze Age, right, before the collapse. And of course, the Iliad and Odyssey weren't written down until, you know, the, the crux of the archaic and classical era of Greece. So it was, it was actually written down much later by a tyrant, the tyrant of Athens, Pisistratus. <clears throat> he decided to uh, regularize it. So it was already uh, oral tradition. Poets had, you know, they would just go all over Greece, different courts, you know, and, and places where people would take symposium, you know, drink wine and recline. And they would hear these very long stories put to poetic verse. These poets would travel around Greece, so everybody was really familiar with a lot of the stories. It was almost like, pick, pick your favorite sitcom, make only that sitcom available <laughs> to everyone <laughs> in the nation. And so everybody memorizes all the episodes, right? And they can say them together and they love it, right? So let's say um, well, something really mediocre like Friends, that sitcom. Does anybody remember Friends, right? I've watched them all. It's mediocre, but, I, but I, I still like it. It's just kind of, you know, light comedy, girlfriend, boyfriend stuff, you know. But if that was the only thing available and that defined our culture, and that's how we taught our children to read by listening to it, and that's where we developed our ideas about how to act and all our moral lessons and all our heroes, you know, all our heroes, because that's the only actual medium we have. Now, that's not the case, more so the case in Sumeria. They had less, you know, literature to partake in. But by the time of the classical era, you had a lot of literature and plays and that sort of thing. But they didn't compare to the Iliad and Odyssey. This was something that your grandparents knew about. Your grandparents before them knew about it. They were the most widely told heroic tales. So as the Bronze Age collapses, the Iron Age, there's no Mycenaeans around anymore. And Homer's Iliad and Odyssey were about the Mycenaeans, right? So they were basically memories of the people who came before. The Iliad is the first one in the series, and it's sort of a long, continuous story. And the Iliad is about Greek forces that assemble under Agamemnon and go over to Troy and sack the city of Troy for whatever reason. They spend 10 years doing this. And you have the story of Achilles. You have, um, strangely enough, the Trojan horse story is not in the Iliad. And um, you have just some great stories. Now, with both the Iliad and the Odyssey, the gods that we know of, the Olympic gods, they're everywhere, influencing things. So you actually have sort of a, a religious epic as well. The Iliad and Odyssey talk about how the gods influenced the different choices that were made behind the scenes. And it's really an, almost an alternate interpretation of the events. It almost reads like there are two different storylines that just happen to parallel. The Odyssey takes place right after the Trojan War, and it's about Odysseus and Odysseus' journey back home. Um, he goes through many different trials. Here's the image on some Greek uh, red figure pottery from the classical era of Odysseus tied to his ship and a siren in the frame. Well, Odysseus, of course, he had his own ship and he was trying to get home. And all the men he had who were rowing the ship were his men. And they were going through a special area where these sirens, these sort of half bird, half women figures, which are actually uh, much more ancient half bird, half women figures, also exist in the Semitic tradition. But these sirens, of course, they would sing and they would lure men just through their voices. They would attract men to steer the ship. And basically the ship would be destroyed on the rocks because it was a real rocky area you know, where the sirens lived and the ships would break up and the sirens could just swoop down and pick off flesh from the drowning men and the men who were stuck on the rocks and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and so the trick, Odysseus is clever. He's, that's his thing. He's not stronger than everyone. He's not faster. He's just more clever than everyone else. Uh, he's the one who comes up with the idea of the Trojan horse. And so he has his men tie him up. So he finally makes it home. And so throughout the Iliad and Odyssey, you, you have a great number of heroes that are featured. It's almost like they come onto stage, do their thing, and then they leave in some cases. And maybe you, they're not reoccurring so much. You know, many heroes are reoccurring. But what you get is you get aristocracy in the classical era drawing their own bloodlines to many of these heroes. And we don't know if some of these heroes were real people or not, you know, or anything. But because of their an epic tradition, they were used, they were exploited to create aristocratic validity. So that has to do with creating a sense of identity. The aristocracy needs a strong identity, or it's just not going to hold up unless you're just 
you know, stabbing people all the time, you know, or you're giving them free bread or something, right? Also, as a sense of identity, and this is true for the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Iliad Odyssey, and the Aeneid, is that's how children would learn to read. So you would learn, a lot of times you'd learn the rhythm of the poetic lines ahead of time on some of these verses from one of these epics. But then you also learn how to spell and write by reciting and writing down excerpts uh, from these. One really interesting about the Iliad and Odyssey is if you study the Greek language and say you want to study the Old or in the New Testament, you have to study one version of Greek. If you want to study Greek literature, you study another one. And if you want to study the Iliad Odyssey and Hesiod, uh, earlier stuff, you actually have to study Epic Greek. And of course, I've studied both regular Greek and Epic Greek. But what you have with Homer's Iliad and Odyssey is you have not just one Greek dialect in it, but you have many Greek dialects in the actual poetry, in the book, in the books. And so if you learned to read from the Iliad and Odyssey and you were aristocratic and say you did a lot of trade and you knew a lot of aristocrats from other cities, you know, if you were poor and tied to the land, you might not come into a whole lot of contact with other cities as much as a aristocrat. You would learn these other dialects. You would become familiar with some of these other dialects throughout Greece, throughout Attica and the Peloponnese and um, Thessaly. You would actually learn variations of words. It's a very interesting tool. Virgil's Aeneid. This was more plotted, Virgil's Aeneid was more plotted and planned to exist as sort of imperial propaganda. So after the horrible civil wars of Rome, the Republic has already fallen and the empire, sounds like Star Wars, the empire is in control. And so Emperor Octavian Augustus is the first emperor proper, aside from Julius Caesar, and he commissions Virgil to write this epic tale. And so in this epic tale, you're doing almost the exact thing, same thing these other earlier epics were doing, Homer and Gilgamesh, but you're doing it on purpose, and you're actually putting royal Roman families in it. And here's something very clever. So not only are you putting sort of like creating noble lineages for Romans, like Julius Caesar's family, the Iulius, as a clever play on words, you can take the last name Iulius and link it to Ilium. And through that sort of transformation of words, you could trace uh, Julius Caesar's ancestry to Troy, which is in Ilium. And so artificially, this story was created to create a special, almost holy lineage for Rome, like a background story for Rome, completely fabricated, that takes off right where the Iliad ended. In the Iliad, Troy falls. The Aeneid takes off, even though it was written hundreds of years later, it starts where the Iliad ends. So as Troy falls, what Virgil does, and probably also Emperor Augustus, they're showing how Aeneas, a hero from the Iliad, escaped Troy and founded Rome, all the way over here in Italy. Of course, this is completely fictitious, but this was written to purposefully imitate these earlier epics in force. So if you have, say, a modern nation and you don't have an epic, well, you need to create one. Almost every nation has an epic, an epic tradition they can draw on. In Rome, because of the start of the empire, they needed stability, they needed a strong tradition, especially to grant legitimacy to the uh, Iulius clan and other nobles. Um, you're able to sort of prop those aristocrats up and make them seem more noble and more tied to the history of Rome uh, than they really are. So the Aeneid is very interesting. It's imitating what the Epic of Gilgamesh and Homer's Iliad and Odyssey is doing in terms of granting validity and authority to existing aristocratic peoples, even specific ones, you know, in this case. And so uh, Aeneas, the main hero, of, of Virgil's Aeneid. He has many different characteristics that really can't be pinned down, but the one characteristic that he has is a sense of duty to his own family. And so, as almost a moral tale, um, the Aeneid is telling your average Roman citizen 
that it's not all about your personal heroic ideals like the Greek epics, but our epic is that we care more for the family and for Rome itself and for the, you know, the Roman state. You sacrifice your individuality to your family and the Roman state. I mean, really a common value in many communities, but it, they try to express it strongly to give a sense of duty and belonging in the state to the average Roman. So very interesting. So as you study these epics throughout your life, Keep that in mind about those three. They had a great impact on the culture that they touched. So just to wrap it up, an epic, an epic tradition is the story of your people. Whether it is or not, <laughs> you appropriate it, right? A culture appropriates things and makes it true. More modern nationalism has to do with sharing a language, which these epics do. They teach you about language and various dialects and they give you a stronger sense of what we would call national identity. And that's just what the Aenea did on purpose, and the other two did on accident. Adds legitimacy to the aristocracy. It promotes learning and language. And all three of them are heavily fortified with ethic and moral tales. So it's almost like that was their original intention, to provide some sort of insight into the strange thing that people see as the world as reality you know because early on of course you're just trying to explain things right you're coming up with gods natural gods and superstitions just to explain the weird stuff that you can't explain you know so an epic tradition does that for a culture and an individual